on universities with the sustainability movement, right? So that not only, so, so sustainability in terms of like recycling started in college campuses. So I, when I was in college in the 70s, nobody recycled except for students. And we started the first campus-wide recycling program. We figured out how to make it work. Everyone said it was crazy. How could you have a bunch of cans, you know, and like put them somewhere and then take them somewhere else? And, and who was going to sort through it all? I mean, but we worked it all out as students. And, you know, I can remember late at night, like, crunching cans and, and before we had curbside recycling. I mean, we did that. And then we came up with a model for the rest of the world. And so it started off with recycling, and then it ended up in the, um, the material side of the college campus, in the operations side, right? So that we now have dormitories that are carbon neutral. We have you know, uh, sh bike share operations and car share operations that start off on college campuses and then become a model for other places. And then the curriculum itself is be has been changed. So the ideas, the, our language, you know, it's moved now that we have environmental humanities, right? I mean, here at Stony Brook, and this is one of the only places in the world that has that. And, and then finally, then, the last frontier of college campuses is the, uh, is the institution as a financial institution. So there's the whole divestment movement that 350 started with college students. And the idea is that we're going to get all of our financial institutions from divest to divest from fossil fuel holdings because here you are investing in the very thing that is destroying the planet and killing our children. And so let's get our money out of there and put it somewhere else. Um, and why not start with colleges? Because it's your tuition dollars, right? So let's get um, the people who have the endowment for SUNY to take the money out of of fossil fuels and somewhere else. And so that, and you know, once the college students succeed in, in getting colleges to switch over, now you see churches starting to divest and you, see, and, and you know, it will start to spread hospitals, you know, things like that. So I think there's a lot of roles that college students can play. And certainly on, on nearly on every college campus, I don't know about this one, we have a chapter of New Yorkers against fracking, you know, like we have college students against fracking or the NYPERGs on each college campus can play a really powerful role. And, and also because you guys, don't have straight jobs and you are a little more flexible than regular working stiffs, you can often take a day off and go to Albany with us and, and you know, let your bodies and your voices speak. So to that end, I could say on January 8th, if you want to mark your calendars, January 8th is the one day of the year we know where Pres uh, Governor Cuomo will be because he gives a state of the state address. He always gives it to Alb in Albany to the legislature. So we know he's going to be there on January 8th. Last year we brought 3,000 people to Albany. We, want, we made a line a quarter mile long so that every single legislator who walked in to hear the governor went past um, all of us anti-fracking activists who had our messages. We had uh, Pete Seeger there um, and so on. And so we're going to do that again. It's important to us to keep showing that the movement is building out and it's very diverse. So we would love for all of you to get on a bus. We always run buses. Um, get on a bus uh, and join us in Albany on the 8th. Uh, and then this comment, I mean, these com this comment period that we're in for Port Ambrose, I can't think of anything more important than college students bringing the knowledge that you have, especially in the sciences. And, you know, SUNY, Stony Brook is our premier scientific institution of, of New York. So for you to write a comment that's devastating to show the, the fallacy of liquefied natural gas as a fuel, and there's so much that needs to be done. I'm actually looking for somebody to help me do an economic cost-benefit analysis because the, the, the only science that this whole thing hinges on, the liquefied natural gas, is to say that if we had trucks burning LNG, the emissions would be cleaner than burning diesel. All right, but if you look at the, behind that, what you see is that if you, that's only true if you're just talking about tailpipes. Because if you include the energy that's required to bring the natural gas down to minus 259, that's not being drawn from a bunch of solar panels. You're burning fossil fuels to just cool it down, and then in order to regasify it, you're flaring it off. And then, you, in order for it to remain a liquid, you have to constantly vent methane into the atmosphere for evaporative cooling, otherwise the whole thing will explode. And so if you add up all the greenhouse gases and the ground level air pollutants, all the, go into, all the externalities that go into making LNG, it turns out, I believe, it's just as dirty as coal. But I really need uh, uh, like a, a cost-benefit analyst, somebody who's really good to, at taking those numbers and actually model it out and bring that before um, the legislature because it, it's, a, it's a deceptive argument and we need really good minds like you provide here to do that kind of analysis because I think the emperor has no clothes here, but I, I'd, like some, I'd like some real data to, to prove that.
I yeah. think we should move to the reception. We can, and any more questions you have, yeah. ask yeah. the yeah. door. Yeah. Yeah.